All right. So in the last lecture, we talked about the concept of the brainstem. We talked about the hindbrain, the midbrain. We even talked about the thalamus. Now we're going to move into the limbic system. So what is the limbic system? So the limbic system is a donut shaped network of brain structures that are responsible for things like fear, memory, emotions, and basic drives. Now, uh, this is not an all inclusive list, but the four significant parts of the limbic system are the hypothalamus, amygdala, hippocampus, and pituitary. Let's go into it. So Similar to what we said about superior and inferior in the midbrain, right? Superior meant above, inferior meant below, right? In terms of the position of the brain structure. Hypo uh, and hyper, hyper means more than or above, hypo means less than or below. So the hypothalamus is right below the thalamus. Now we talked about the concept or of the fight or flight response when we're in sympathetic arousal. The hypothalamus is responsible for helping us with the fight or flight response. Now, um, if you have damage or lesion to the hypothalamus, it will uh, make you more subdued. It will attenuate anger and rage. Uh, now, we have three parts of the hypothalamus that are worth mentioning. Uh, the, hypo, the lateral hypothalamus is your um, hunger center. It tells you when it's time to start eating or drinking. Uh, so whenever you get those hunger pangs, uh, the cues come from a message from the lateral hypothalamus. Uh, the concept of aphagia, which is a lacking of or refusal to eat and drink, is linked to some kind of damage to the lateral hypothalamus. Now, similar to having a, a part of the brain that tells you when you're hunger, hungry, you also need to have a part of the brain that tells you when you're done eating or when you're satiated, right? So the ventral medial hypothalamus is responsible for telling you when it's time to stop eating, right? So damage to the ventral medial hypothalamus will result in hyperphagia, which is excessive eating. Now, the anterior hypothalamus is responsible for sexual activity, uh, and if you were to put an electrode into the anterior hypothalamus, uh, it would stimulate the same um, pleasure or desires as one having sex. So the anterior hypothalamus is responsible for that. Damage to the anterior hypothalamus could affect one's sex drive and sex activity stimulation could result in hypersexuality. So uh, when you think about it, eating disorders are linked to the hypothalamus. Sex-related disorders are, are linked to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus also plays other roles like a, a homeostasis role or a thermostat role, however you wanna say it. But uh, when you break it down, it plays uh, some critical, uh, pretty critical roles in uh, basic functioning. Now the amygdala. The amygdala is referred to as amygdala because of its shape. It, it refers to an almond shaped cluster. Now you have two of them because you have two sides of the brain, right? The left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. But the amygdala is responsible for fear and, and rage. So some aggressive behaviors are linked to the amygdala. And there was an old study done by Kluver and Busey, uh, which they surgically lesioned or damaged the amygdala. And they took uh, 
primates or monkeys that are typically aggressive and turn them into docile creatures, right? So uh, damage to the amygdala could affect one's uh, aggression. The hippocampus, we talked about the hippocampus briefly when we talked about Alzheimer's and acetylcholine, right? So there are a lot of factors at play. You'll see that there's brain structure, brain physiology, and brain chemistry. But the brain structure that's largely linked to Alzheimer's is the hippocampus. And it plays a role in learning and memory and the consolidation of memory. So if you were to damage uh, part of the hippocampus, you would affect one's memory processing. You would affect their learning, right? So the ability to uh, create and store new memories would be damaged. That's your hippocampus. Now, as I said, the hippocampus is linked to um, uh, Alzheimer's. Now, you can have different kinds of amnesia. So amnesia is memory loss, right? So we have two that we refer to. One is called anterograde amnesia, which I referenced in the previous slide. And then there's retrograde amnesia. Anterograde amnesia, if you look at the beginning of the, the word, antero means anterior or in front of us, right? So Anterograde amnesia is the inability to create or establish new long-term memories. Whereas retrograde amnesia, retro um, refers to behind us, right? Or in the past. So retrograde amnesia is the inability to access previous memories, right? That happened prior to the brain injury. So we have different problems. One is the ability to consolidate and store new memories. Two is the inability to access old memories. If you were to think of movies, can you think of a movie that would be linked to anterograde amnesia? Anyone think of a movie that's linked to anterograde amnesia? Memento. Tell me about Memento because I haven't seen it. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's about the this guy that like forgets every day, like every other day. So he tattoos himself so he remembers what's going on. Okay, so that would be a good example of anterograde uh, amnesia. The one Finding that... Nemo. Finding Nemo. Or was it Finding Dory? Dory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the first one. That would be, well, that one's tricky because there's the inability to store new memories, but there's also some gaps in past memory as well. But largely the premise is the uh, anterograde. So, so I would argue that Dory had both, but I can see the argument. How about 51st Dates? Anyone watch that rom-com? Yes, uh, I was not able to re remember the name. Yeah, 51st Dates is a real good one for anterograde amnesia as well. Uh, how about retrograde amnesia? Again, accessing old information. Joseph. Um, Maze Runner. I haven't seen it, so tell me about it. Um, basically, it's like a, it's kind of like a, it's like a dystopian movie. So it's like mm -hmm. kind of the end of the world. There were teenagers that were put inside of a maze because like they were supposed to have a cure for a disease. Mm -hmm. One of the teenagers worked with the people that were setting everything up, but he switched sides, so they took away his memories. Uh huh. So he can't access old memories. So that would be good. That's a good one for retrograde amnesia. And then um, anyone see The Notebook? Yes, sure. So The Notebook is another one of those movies 
which reflects retrograde amnesia, right? So uh, think about it. You have this person reading their love story that was written down in a diary over and over and over. They're in late adulthood and he's just hoping that his wife would remember how they met and everything so that it would click, right? So she has limited access to their their past history together. So the notebook would be a really good example of retrograde amnesia. I see there's something in the chat uh, regarding Henry. Sophia, tell me about that one as well. So um, in the movie, this man, uh, like before this incident happened, like this accident, um, mm -hmm. He was very smart. He was like a lawyer and everything. And mm -hmm. like he got shot in the head. And then after mm -hmm. that, he lost like a bunch of abilities. Like, uh, he had to relearn how to speak, how to read, how to write, how to walk. And he completely forgot about his, his family. Um, mm -hmm. And like in the end, he like quit his job. He quit um, working as a lawyer because he would rather be with like family and everybody like close to him than like fake uh, like coworkers or friends. Cause it was a very toxic like community that he mm. was working in. Okay. So yeah. like he so, realized like, Oh, I don't want to be around those people. Yeah. So that, that could fit the bill for retrograde as well. So, so there are tons of movies. It's part of our pop culture, but uh, I wanted to anchor it, uh, what we're saying on the slides with some kind of uh, pop culture reference. Now, we talked about the hypothalamus, we talked about the amygdala, we talked about the hippocampus, and, but we didn't talk about the pituitary. Does anyone know the functioning of the pituitary? It controls your hormones. Right. Good job, James. So if you open up a biology textbook, they will refer to the pituitary as, quote unquote, the master endocrine gland, right? Because it regulates between the anterior and posterior pituitary eight different hormones. Now, when you take a biopsych class, you'll learn that it's a little more complicated than that, right? So when you hear the word master endocrine gland, the word master would imply that it's in control, right? But you learn about feed forward and feed back loops that regulate hormones as well. Uh, and th then you start to say, hey, wait, is this really the master endocrine gland? Because in order for the pituitary to fire, it needs to receive input from the hypothalamus to say, okay, I need you to secrete hormone X, right? So if it's being told what to do by the hypothalamus, is it really in charge, right? And then as we go down from the pituitary to the thyroid, the, uh, the kidneys, and then the gonads, they all have what's called feedback loops saying, hey, wait a minute, I have an oversupply or an undersupply of hormone Y, you need to secrete less. So if the thyroid and the, the kidneys and the gonads are saying, give me more, give me less, is the pituitary really in charge, right? So um, that's my biggest criticism of how things are written in in textbooks but uh let me take your bio uh, psych textbook off the hook a little bit i don't think when they say master endocrine gland they mean it that way right they don't mean it's in charge they mean it's the primary one it's the one that controls the most hormones so uh if you ever read that the pituitary gland is the master endocrine gland, uh, just keep in mind that they're not saying it's necessarily in charge. It just is responsible for regulating the most amount of hormones. Oh. Now, I said it's like a donut-shaped structure. If we were to look at it, 
here's our pituitary, here's our um, hypothalamus. Now it's hypothalamus, if you look relative, this is our thalamus looking like an egg above it. Uh, the amygdala looks like an almond and the hippocampus. Now, one of the phrases that I want you to pay attention to is things that wire together, fire together, right? So if, if you were to look at the amygdala and the hippocampus, they're next to one another, right? So I said the amygdala was responsible for things like fear and rage. I said that the hippocampus is responsible for memory. Now, one of the interesting findings is that people with Alzheimer's uh, disease, they tend to uh, have bouts of anger or outburst. And you might say, well, if it was just about memory, then why, why are they having these bout, out, outbursts or bouts of anger? The answer is uh, there's also damage or an atrophy or shrinking to the amygdala as well. And that causes damage to emotion regulation and increased anger and whatnot. Uh, and a good example of this is if you watch Grey's Anatomy, uh, Meredith Grey, her mom would have days where she was lucid and then other days she was absolutely irate. But uh, I think that's a good lesson that because they're next to one another, they're gonna be affected by one another as well. So uh, that's uh, one explanation. All right, so let me stop the recording on the limbic system and in our next discussion, we'll talk about the cerebral cortex.